Political comedy cockfight. Talking heads head to head. First female Mexican president for week ended June 8th, 2024. The criteria on which we judge our comedians, number one, philosophy of humor style based on the output of the jokes. We'll try to get into the comedian's head to think about how they see humor, what's the philosophy of humor that they subscribe to. Number two, fallacies. The most popular incongruity theory of comedy basically says that a joke is a logical construction that has basically been broken. There is incongruity that has been introduced. Fallacies representing deviations or wrong thinking related to formal logic. Therefore, we're going to look at some of the jokes and see if we can fit them into a fallacy construction that has been exaggerated for comedic effect. Rhetorical techniques, which include things like rhyme, rhythm, assonance, alliteration, and many, many more flowers of language. How much of this is being added to the presentation or formation of the joke? And what's the impact of the rhetorical techniques on us, the listener? Remembering that some rhetorical techniques can often be or actually be the baseline on which jokes are constructed, such as, for example, bumper stickers, which usually have a parallel construction that's the first foundation on which the joke is then built. Modern tools like AI to improve it. Most of these comedians come from a world of stand-up comedy, moving to online and social media formats as now, and therefore are probably not as quick to adjust to the dancing, the changing landscape with things like AI images, like chat GTP, giving individuals like us possibly an in, a way to basically get into the market. So for example, these large institutions, they have name recognition, they have advertising, and I do not think that the social media platforms are a even playing field in any way, shape, or form. However, these large institutions are also big bureaucracies with their own politics that they have to deal with and so on and so forth. And they can't easily change as this rapidly changing landscape changes and therefore taking advantage of new angles, new technology such as AI art, video, movie clips and whatnot is an advantage the individual has because they don't have to talk to the committee. to do what they want to do. I am not a committee. Presentation style and body language. In other words, how much of the joke is dependent simply on the structure of the wording of the joke and how much of the joke is dependent on the presentation, the body language, even the tonality of the person presenting the joke. Is the joke uh, situation used to make a joke or is the joke designed to make a political point or both? This is going to be more of a spectrum because we're looking at people that are both comedians, but they also are trying to make a political point. So the question is, are they on more of the side of taking the current situation to make people laugh? Or are they more on the side of using their comedic talent and tools to push their political viewpoint? Resources. We might provide a PDF or possibly an online OneNote resource with definitions. However, if you want more information about the flowers of rhetoric, rhetorical tools, I highly recommend, although am not affiliated with in any way, The Elements of Eloquence, Secrets of the Perfect Turn of Phrase by Mark Forsyth, found in audiobook format on Audible as well as Kindle format. I like the audiobook because it's quite funny in a dry British humor style. And although quite funny, it's the best book I've seen on this topic, even though I've looked for other books on this topic. Also, I highly recommend The Great Courses, although I'm not affiliated with them at all. They now have a streaming platform with many of their courses on it. Personally, I have now canceled Disney. I've canceled Netflix. I have the streaming of the great courses as well as some crunchy roll for my anime. This course, An Introduction to Formal Logic, gets into what formal logic is and the fallacies, remembering that that kind of lines up with joke structure. Joke structure, according to the incongruity theory of comedy, being a system or argument that has been broken. There's incongruity. 
Another course is Take My Course, Please, The Philosophy of Humor. This isn't really a course for comedians to make stand-up comedy, but it gets into the theory of what comedy is. Both these courses by Stephen Gimbel, who has done comedic work himself, but is more of a professional philosopher and teacher. Also, uh, some of this information comes from Greg Dean, Step by Step to Stand-Up Comedy, which is the most straightforward, this is how to construct a joke book that you can find. So if you have any interest in constructing jokes, I would think this is the place to start. Comparing Gutfield versus Stewart, remembering that you can find these on the YouTubes, the full title for the Gutfield presentation, Gutfield, the saga of Donald Trump continues, the full title for the Stewart presentation, John Stewart tackles the Trump conviction fallout and puts the media on trial at the daily show we're going to start with gutfield basically because i like him better he's going to drive me less crazy most likely and he's got a cool name gutfield sounds like what you would name a gory battlefield after the battle with guts laying all over the field you called it gutfield or like a baseball stadium where everybody drinks too much beer and they throw their guts up all over the place and you call it gutfield baseball stadium or something like that in any case we'll start here and try to analyze the jokes related to this specific topic, noting that this topic probably would have gotten more engagement if it didn't line up in the same week with the Trump conviction, which if you're doing news topics, is just an interesting thing to keep in mind. What's the top of the news? What kind of stories could have really made some traction but aren't because they happen to line up with other stories? That's a place that could lead to opportunities because you could hit a topic that should be pretty popular, but it's not getting the attention be just be by where it lined up to something else. Okay. Thank you. I had to work hard to get one out of you. <laughs> uh, I wonder if they're gonna like these. Mexico has officially elected their first ever female president. I know. Yeah, like you care. Oh, finally a woman. Oh, you go girl. Okay, so if we look at that from an incongruity standpoint, notice what his setup, all he said with the setup was Mexico has hired his first female president. That's just the headline. All he did was say the headline. He didn't really say any other assumptions, but we make assumptions whenever that is the case. So notice the assumption, you can make multiple assumptions. We'll get into that later in terms of, of making assumptions that you can then break with a joke premise, but you don't have to actually say that in the the line because these are oftentimes assumptions it's the unspoken assumptions that often are the things that can make the joke and in america the unspoken assumption probably in many parts of of the world at this point in time is anytime we say it's the first female or it's the first whatever or whatever whatever that is in this particular position whatever that position is we're supposed to all say, well, that's great. That's a gla glass ceiling that has been broken and so on and so forth. And of course, he's playing on the idea of, we've seen that story play out many times. I'm getting tired of, I'm getting bored of it. And and we should go back to maybe a merit, meritocracy type of system, hiring people on their talent, not just on these kind of characteristics. And so that's the assumption that's being broke from a kind of an incongruity standpoint. Shut up. Her name is Claudia Scheinbaum. That's right. Claudia Scheinbaum. You know, of the Tijuana Scheinbaums. Now, this, he's getting into a little bit of a more delicate area topic with regards to pe people's you know, heritage, right? In terms of, we're talking about Mexico. Obviously, we're Americans, and now we're talking about Mexico. We don't know too much about what we're talking about there. And then we have uh, the name, which sounds, if you just looked at the first and last name, of course, it sounds like the first name uh, sounds very Mexican, is what you would, might expect. And then the last name sounds quite Jewish. So those two things, just as a just position lined up one after the other in and of themselves, looks a little bit strange, right? So you're emphasizing those two things that look like they're different with the same person's first name, uh, versus the last name and so that's kind of the incongruity when he says oh yeah of the of the Tijuana shine bombs Tijuana is a city that's pretty close uh, to 
across the border from California. And I, I believe what he's going for there is, is, of course, most people in Tijuana are going to have Spanish or Mexican sounding names. Rodriguez is over there in Tijuana's and whatnot. You're probably not going to find too many shine bombs in Tijuana, you would think. I think that's kind of the just position that he's going for uh, with that joke. <laughs> you should try her get felt of fish tacos. <laughs> now, see this one, he's continuing on with the theme now because he's taking these two parallel ideas and, and, he, and, and there's incongruity that seems like there's between them because they seem they're coming, like they're coming from two different heritages even though they're one person and now he's taking two dissimilar things and putting them together as well. Food, I, and I believe this is true, I'm not an expert on the food so I didn't actually really get this at first, but obviously he's taking food that you might be thinking is more Mexican type of food and food that you might be thinking is more of a Jewish type food and putting them together in a way that doesn't exactly fit and that's going to basically be the in the incongruity uh, that is taking place so in other words what's the assumption the assumption is you know the this taco or the fish taco doesn't match with this with this other type of food they don't go together but we put them together and basically uh, broke that assumption so again, I'm fairly familiar with Mexican food. I, it's funny because I'm actually a CPA who worked in LA. So I've, I've had some of my first jobs were, were at basically uh, Jewish firms, but I didn't really know much about, I still don't know much about uh, Jewish food. I wasn't, I wasn't, a, I was, a, was not a picky eater when I was out of college. So I, can't, I think I kind of thought, you know, uh, if, if the thing is kosher, it's probably not that good. That's probably, probably not a correct thing to think. Uh, you know, it's probably a healthy thing to eat that way, but that maybe that's why I didn't pick up on the food too much at the time. But continuing on. But her first order of business as president, getting her daughter to marry a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so once again, he's playing on like a stereotype on uh, this one. So we're gonna say she's, she's a Jewish president. So as a mom and as a, a Jewish mom, you might have an assumption that comes from a stereotype that she's going to want to get her daughter married to a well-off person. So what's, what's the assumption that is being broken? The country will be most important priority. So if you just say the headline, that's one of the assumptions that would come from the headline. We have the first female Mexican president. Well, she's a president therefore the country is going to be the most important thing in her job as the president that would be the the assumption the untold assumption broken by the line her daughter getting married to a well-off man uh, is the main priority so notice we'll look at techniques that, that we can come up with these kind of just position things one of the techniques might be a listing technique where you're listing things related to a mother or possibly a Jewish mother, and then you're listing things uh, related to being president, and then you're putting them together in a just position, which is comical because of the incongruity between the two things that we're listing together. Now, if I tried to analyze that from a fallacy standpoint, remember we listed off some of these fallacies and whatnot, which is basically a breaking of that of a, a logical pattern we might call it arguing by analogy for example because the top priority for an for a mother is getting the daughter to marry a well-off man so therefore the top priority for a mother who is president will be basically the same she's not going to change her priorities it's going to be the same whether president or not you also anytime you have these jokes that are based off of a stereotype then then the joke is based on a common assumption that's already out there. So, so the assumption is, well, you know how women are, you know how Jewish women are, right? That's going to be the common assumption. And, and th this is why these topics, of course, are kind of touchy topics, because sometimes those stereotypes are unfair and whatnot, but other times they, they're just, they have some truth to them, they're just some, and so that's why they're kind of funny to basically play off of. So that's why it's kind of a touchy subject. But anytime that you're talking about a, a stereotype, you're basically appealing, appealing to common opinion. And, and that's always oft, often going to be subject to problems like groupthink and mob mentality and that kind of stuff. But, but again, that, those are the 
undergirding assumptions that you can basically break to make a joke. So that's going to be from that standpoint. Uh, he also used some alliteration because notice he said that he, that she wants to get her daughter to marry a doctor. So if he said she wanted to get her daughter married to a lawyer or her son married to son, right or to her son to be a doctor or whatever, then notice you don't have that double D right there. It wouldn't sound quite as as uh, illiterate to say the daughter marry a lawyer, right? And he also has some assonance, so he picked the daughter is marrying a doctor. So daughter marrying a doctor rolls off the tongue a little bit more easily than the daughter may married a lawyer, right? So, and also, uh, you can also see that it has a harder sound, doctor versus lawyer. So oftentimes in comedy, you'll hear that the hard sounds like a C sound or a K sound, K, J, G, happen to be more funny for whatever reason than softer sounds. So an L, lawyer, doesn't sound quite as funny as doctor, which kind of hits you a little bit harder or, you know, something. So that's, you know, daughter married a chiropractor or, or something like it might sound a little bit more funny just because you have those harder sounds which lead them, lend themselves to be more funny. So modern tools, uh, so notice he's using the image of the president, but they're, they're really basic on some of these modern tools. They probably have a whole team helping him write jokes, right? And they probably have a whole team that's doing the editing, but they're not really doing like any of the new stuff in there. They're not, they could make images of, of you know, a generic president that, that, that is, is looking hopefully at a doctor, right? As president or, or an image of a president at a wedding doesn't have to be her particularly you could try to put that into AI but they're kind of limiting the likeness of an actual person but you can put a female president in AI images as though they're staring at a doctor or you can look for movies where there's a female president in it there's many movies these days and get a get a movie quote from it and so we'll take a look at some of those possibilities where you can take a simple joke like this and make it into a skit that's a, that's you know, a 15 minute skit or at least a seven minute skit that he really did in just a minute joke and, and add some quality detail to it just by adding, you know, images and possibly movie clips. Uh, chat GTP word list. So we'll talk about some of those techniques that we can use, use with this example maybe later. Jokes related to female president. So we'll talk more about that later. President style and body language. Uh, so notice that his style, I think he's more of a straight to the point joke person, right? He, he said the minimum he needed to say to set up the premise. One of it was just the headline, right? It's just like, well, here's the first Mexico has hired the first female president. That's all he needed to say. And then he went directly to the punch, right? And so, and, and so he's, that's a more, more direct kind of style. It's not about his acting or anything like that so much. Although his style and presentation, I think, is more like he's not trying to. It doesn't sound to me like he's putting her down, or put or trying to put himself up or putting himself down. Really, it sounds to me more like he's acting like a child on the playground, saying, "Ha ha, isn't that funny? I'm doing word game, and here's a little word game, and you could see the joke because there's this incongruity." And that's the feel that basically I get from it. And again, that might be somewhat subjective, depending on if you agree with him or not, if you, or if you like his style, or if you, you know, you might just not like him, and then you think so. I don't know, but that's what it comes off to me like. And I think there is some objectivity with that. And is the political situation used to make a joke, or a joke, uh, or is the joke designed to make a political point? So in this case, this joke is pretty benign joke. It doesn't seem that he's making a political point. He did talk about, of course, a glass ceiling and saying, hey, look, I'm getting, it seems that he's indicating, getting a little sick of this, not caring about anything but someone's race or gender or ethnicity when we're hiring people. That doesn't seem like the way to go. It seems like that's kind of like an indication of like when he's saying, uh, oh, who cares that she's a woman? We've seen it before <laughs> kind of thing. Can she do the job might be a better question. So, but it but it looks to me like he's using more of this setup just to get a, a punchline joke rather than to make a, a political point to me. 
All right, let's take a look at uh, Stuart here. So we'll do a similar process for Stuart. Let me back this up a little bit. <laughs> Through the art of lying. And <laughs> Mexico has just elected its... So he was hitting on the... I won't get into the <laughs> to that one. Let's go to the next first one. First female and its first Jewish president. So I'm very much looking forward to NPR's coverage of it because they are always... <laughs> They are always very careful to pronounce names authentically, so I'm sure it'll be like, turning now to the newly elected Mexican president, Claudia Sheinbaum. So that's basically uh, what we so what we've got there, and then he went to his monologue. So he kind of used this joke, it seems to me, as kind of a, a breakup joke that's actually a joke kind of more just for joke purposes before he led into the topic of main concern, which is, of course, uh, the presidency, where he basically did a, a monologue that seems more like an argumentative, persuasive monologue. So this was kind of like the opening joke to, to warm people up to then take the serious topic going forward. Gutfield did a similar kind of thing, too, right? He did this similar process. They both decided, hey, we're going to start with this one, to kind of warm people up with a joke that's not really the main topic that we're looking at. And then they went into their main topic, possibly because you can think of that from a joke standpoint that they thought that would that would warm people up to the their better material from a joke standpoint, or possibly you could say that's going to warm people up with a joke. In the case of Stewart, I think this is my more cynical view. We're going to roll people up with a joke so they're more susceptible to accept my political argument that I'm going to make a persuasive argument after that, right? Is kind of what is how I kind of feel it was put together. But so th so the assumption here, uh, newscaster will pronounce her name in a professional way. So the assumption, of course, being there's the first notice also with Stewart's whole routine here, it takes him a little bit longer to get to the punch. So it's not just like, hey, here's like Gutfield was basically saying, Mexico has a new female Mexican president. That was the setup, right? And then he went directly to the punch. With, with this particular joke, he had to line it up a little bit. So notice what he had to say here. First Mexican president, the name of, of the president, so you can see the incongruity, and then naming the news channel. And then you kind of have to have that insider knowledge with the news channel, knowing that the news channel uh, tends to try to pronounce people's names in ethnically accurate ways. In other words, as Americans, we can try to pronounce things in English. And so we're not properly trying to have a have like a Mexican or Spanish or Jewish accent on a word. Uh, or we can try to be brave and <laughs> and see if we can have the accent on the words. And certain news stations do that, right? They try to pronounce the words in their native uh, pronunciation. And so you have to kind of know that. He tells you that in the prompt. But again, if you're in the in crowd, you would kind of know that. And then he can finally get to the joke. So the, so the assumption would be the newscasters are trying to be professional. They're trying to pronounce the names in a professional and respectful way. And then the alternative story the newscaster will pronounce the name in an awkward way to try and stay in conformity with the tradition of pronouncing names according to the person's backgrounds indicated by the name, right? So now, in other words, they're going to try to do the respectful thing and sound professional, but it's going to come out funny because you have someone whose names sound like they come from two different ethnic backgrounds and therefore should have two different ethnic sounds when you pronounce them the first one he tries to make sound suave and spanishy uh, and then the next one he tries to make sound jewishy now notice that the second one also i think he he always has his angle it seems to me is a little bit more kind of derogatory so i'm not saying that that it's like going you're going too far or anything like that i'm just saying that if we look at his philosophy of humor style, it seems to me, again, Gutfield has more of like a playful type of style. It doesn't feel to me like he's putting someone else down necessarily. And remember, the philosophies of humor are basically, one, why do we laugh? Well, you could say because there's incongruity. 
And then also you could say some people have a style basically where they're putting the other person down and that's part of the thing that's, that's funny because they're laughing at somebody. And you could also have a style where you're putting yourself down like a Rodney Dangerfield or a more British type of humor. So people are basically kind of laughing at you. And again, there's good or bad ways to do both of those, I think, that are disparaging or non-disparaging. And then, and then you could also have a philosophy of humor where basically you're doing more of a, a playful thing, possibly not trying to put anyone else down or have, but thinking of it more of a, a playful kind of situation. So usually you have a mix of those types of things. I think John Stewart clearly has an angle of we're in the end crowd, we're the cool people. And so most of his jokes almost, you know, they're designed to put whoever's on the screen up here, whoever's on the little box is going to be made fun of, right? That's kind of the, the thing. So obviously the second sound of the name sounded a little bit more you know, kind of derogatory than I think what Gutfield was, where he Gutfield used a stereotype of, you know, uh, uh, of like Jewish mothers wanting to get their daughter married off to a doctor. But that didn't sound but that sounds to me like not exactly that sounds like a playful use of a general kind of stereotype that doesn't seem like mean, really, right. So that so again, those are the kind of touchy subjects that come up with these when you're talking about these topics that have uh, a, a, an assumption that's going to be made on it. So in any case, so that's going to be the this one. And then the appeal to uh, tradition. So if I look at it from a fallacy standpoint, so we can say, well, there's kind of an appeal to tradition is kind of a, a fallacy that's in there. Their tradition is to try to pronounce things using foreign accent, which may be absurd if applied to this situation when the first name sounds Spanish and the last name sounds Jewish. So in other words, the fallacy of an appeal to tradition, again, it doesn't mean it's wrong to appeal to something because it is tradition, but if something has changed, that's when there's a problem, right? You would have to define that there is a change and then say, well, it's silly that we're still appealing to tradition when there has been a change, right? So in other words, if you're going into the into the creek and it's freezing cold with a, with a spear so you can spear the trout and you figure out later that you can do it much more easily with a, a fishing line or something like that and not catch cold by going into the river, then maybe it's not the best to appeal to authority in that case, given the new technology, right? But if you didn't have the new technology and whatnot, and you don't have a better explanation than what you have traditionally learned to do, then appealing to, to tradition, you would think would be any case, appeal to common opinion. So once again, he's working on kind of a stereotype here. I, can, I think the idea is that second voice is supposed to, and I'm, I, I'm not exactly and I don't exactly know why, but I guess that second voice is supposed to sound, you know, comically Jewish or something like that. So that so that's going to be and so and we're supposed to just know that. Right. If we didn't know that, then it wouldn't be funny. So we have to have some kind of common opinion that we're that we're working on. And stereotypes work as kind of that common opinion that give us a basis. That's why comedians when I was growing up, comedians always did stereotype things because it's it's just easy to do they're right they're right there you have people's common opinion about particular things and you could you can break those assumptions easily the setup is going to be easy it's already in you already know the common thing that is in people's head now if you go into a situation where the common assumptions are different then that's going to mess anything up because now you don't have that inside knowledge you don't have that common understanding that will help you to construct your joke and then you're going to have to make more complex uh, propositions or premises that you can break the assumption with. So uh, in terms of rhetorical technique, he used some assonance, turning now to the newly elected. So notice when he set up the joke, he set up the joke in his normal tone, and then he had to, to sound like a newscaster and he turned into newscaster voice, right? So you can see here, there's more acting involved in his presentation style possibly than Gutfield, who just who usually uses his own voice. Gutfield doesn't often change his character to say now I'm, and we can call this like POV. We might talk about this more later, but right. You can try to tell a joke from just your perspective or you can try to switch your perspective to somebody else and notice that's what he's done here. 
he's basically said, I'm John Stewart telling you the prompt. And then he switched his perspective to now I'm the newscaster. And he switched his tone of voice to a suave tone of voice that you might expect from someone who's a professional speaker. And then and then he also used more suave, smooth language, which would use more rhetorical tricks uh, like assonance and alliteration. So assonance turning now to the to the newly elected. So we have turning now. There's some assonance, meaning same vowel language to the newly elected. So newly elected, all of those kind of ring together and they kind of prick your ear to sound, say, saying, Ooh, that sounds smooth. That sounds smooth. And so, and then uh, again, in terms of his, I think he could, could spruce this up. He's got a d decent delivery from a comical standpoint. He's using video clips, but look how basic this video clip is. It's nothing, there's nothing but just a news thing, right? You could put AI images uh, in there. Like when he said, when he changes, his, when he, when he goes from a Mexican voice, he could show a Mexican female president or something with an AI image that wouldn't look like her, but it would be, be but it would be similar because the AI image probably won't produce her. And then he could put that just opposed to one that looks more Jewish, uh, possibly as an, as just to just as another prompt, just as an idea from an AI image kind of standpoint uh, that he can put in play. So modern tools, uh, president's style and body language. So again, I think he relies a lot more on his acting skills, framing himself as the in crowd versus the out crowd. And he's doing a little bit more in his acting skills, changing his point of view, changing his position. He actually switched characters, which also, again, way easier to do if you actually have an image on the screen, which shows that now he's he's moving from this character to the next. And this is a thing that I think you can actually learn a lot from like audiobooks because the, the audiobooks, a lot of the readers of audiobooks, when they read a different character, even in a novel, they switch their voice even more than you would in like method acting or something like that. In method acting, you, you're going to play different people, but you're probably not playing a different person during the same set, right? Whereas if you're an audiobook actor, you do kind of what joke comics do. And once one person is talking to another person and you actually change your persona from line to line as you have a conversation with yourself. So some comedians don't do the gut feel doesn't tend to do that as much. And I think I've heard him talk sometimes about how he consciously decided that that's not the style he's going to. So he structures his joke so he can say them kind of first person. But a lot of people can do this, like to do this kind of jumping back and forth through personas, which is a lot more difficult to do on stage when you have nothing else but your face facing one way and facing the other way and your voice. But if you're online, it's way easier because you could change the image. So when he switches to Suave Newscaster, you could put a Suave Newscaster. You won't get his kind of smug look on the face, so, which is part of his style. So you're going to lose that. But you can but if that's not your thing, you can put an image and you can and then you can act out the voice like you would do in an animated s situation or how they do it again in the audiobooks, which is amazing to me. They don't say they stop saying things like this person said George said this Sarah said this and then this was said by they can remove that and just basically change the inflection of their voice which again, they're doing without even a prop image. So if you put a prop image in there, then you can easily just switch back and forth between voices and have a conversation between people, which I think is a, we might look at that later. So he has a longer lead to the joke because of his style uh, as well. And in his much more on the side of, I, I, I think both politi both of these have been used, basically the story was used, I think, to make a joke rather than make a political point. And again, I think Stuart, this whole monologue is basically a monologue stealing up the court case for Donald Trump, trying to say that Trump got what he deserved kind of, kind of argument, right? So I think he used this. I think his whole monologue is more political to persuade people. And I think he's using these stories as warm-up stories to get people to laugh because that loosens people's up, opens them up, to then hit him 
with his with his actual more political argument, which I do think is highly uh, political or persuasive in nature rather than there for the laughs.